Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Quanzer live webinar. I'm Murtaza. I'll be your host and moderator today. This is our second webinar of the webinar series with California State University, and we are honored to have our guest presenter here. This week, we have Dr. Mohammed Hassan with us. He is an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly. He earned his BSc degree in mechatronics engineering from Jordan University of Science and Technology from the University of uh, and, and his MSc and PhD in mechanical and materials engineering from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Prior to joining Cal Poly, he was an assistant professor of robotics engineering at Columbus State University. Hassan's research focuses on intelligent robotics and mechatronic systems, robotic control, machine learning, neuromorphic computing and dynamical systems. Thank you, Murtaza. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. OK, okay awesome. Uh, thanks for the introduction. I'm Mohammed Hassan. I'm an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And I want to just walk you through uh, some demonstration of uh, the use of Kwanzaa and MATLAB for uh, teaching robotics. Let me just share my screen very quickly. Uh, and I want to share my entire screen. Sure. All right. Uh, my goal for today is to show you a sample uh, run for a Kwanzaa Q arm for a pick and place uh, experiment. Uh, I'll only be doing the first part of it, which is navigation and picking through trajectory planning. So, this is some sort of um, experiment that my students. Uh, like to uh, have to do on week five usually or week six of the robotics course. Uh, at that point, students would have been exposed to inverse kinematics, forward kinematics, and would be able to go from joint space into the end effector coordinates uh, forward and backwards. So to avoid uh, the uh, regular joy of troubleshooting uh, code. Uh, it always happens when you're programming anything. I'll show you a video demonstration of uh, the programming that goes into this robot arm, and then we can live um, control this robot arm and uh, make it go from this current default orientation to picking up this red block on the left-hand side of the screen. And so for that, I'll be using uh, MATLAB Simulink to initialize the system. Uh, I will start by adding two blocks, a block that is called hell read. This is the interface to give commands for the robotic arm. Hell write time base is the interface to acquire signal from the robot arm. And this is the most uh, advanced part, uh, complicated part to do, and this is done just by simple two blocks. What I want to do is to give a few commands to the robot arm. I want to give the command for the goal position uh, for each of the joints in the robot. And I will also give commands for the LEDs on the robot arm. So in this case, I can control the joint angles for different uh, manipulators for the robot arm, and I can control the LED light on the robot. And I will give this command later throughout uh, this demonstration to reach the desired trajectory. On the hell read time base, this is where I acquire data from the robot. So this is where I read from the sensors that are available. Uh, for here, let's say that I want to read the currents in each of the joints. Pretty useful if I want to do force control. And let's say for the sake of argument, I also want to find out the actual location of the robot uh, when it comes to joint space and the angular velocity of each of the motors that we have. I can read all of those through the hell read uh, block. After that, 
this constant array that I have in here represents the um, destination that I want to reach. So I want to start from an X coordinate of my gripper at 0.45 and no velocity at all. And I want to reach an X position of 0.65 with no velocity at all. So this is for the rows, for the, uh, this is for, sorry, the columns. Each row represents a goal and starting point, X, Y, Z, and the orientation of the rest. My students will have to figure out a way to go from the starting point to the ending point, and it's pretty convenient to do so using uh, a cubic spline in order to minimize uh, jerk. So I'll do that through a MATLAB script. Uh, I can technically do that using simple blocks in the block diagram, but I'm, I tend to be a little old fashioned when it comes to, uh, to programming. I like to do some things in script, and this allows me to type in what I want to do with my command. So in here, uh, let's say that I want to generate A, which is a, a matrix that gives you the, co the coefficients for the cubic spline. And it takes as an input P, the uh, constant matrix that I showed earlier, and T, which is the time needed uh, to complete the task. It's the ending time. So I start by initializing this array to be to be zeros and I create a loop that allows me to continuously change the values for A in order to create the cubic spline that I need to do. And again, this is a major part of this um, lab. This is what the students need to be able to do. Uh, so this is the value for uh, A0 the constant coefficient for the cubic. This is A1. This is A2. Yeah. And finally, A3. And with this, I get all of the coordinates uh, or all of the coefficients, I mean, of the cubic spline. Now, uh, just verifying here. Let's connect this with our initial and final states and add a constant for the end time. For the sake of this demo, to make the robots move rather quickly, let's say that T end is equal to two. Oh, okay, I set it up to five in here. In the demo that I will show you live, I've set this value to two actually. Let's connect this in here, and this into the other end of the function. Now I have the coefficients that I need to create uh, the location of the end effector as a function of time, and this function is going to be a smooth function. I'll create another script. And the goal of this next uh, script is to specify the desired end effector location at each time step. So I'll call this location of gripper. This is rather a simple function. What I wanted to do is just to follow the cubic spline. And I also want to hold the robot in place after I reach uh, T end. 
at the end of the task. I don't want to continue with, uh, I don't want it to continue to move. So I'll specify P and gamma. P is the location of the gripper. And as you can see, I kind of flipped the function location in here. Uh, so P is the location of the end of the gripper and gamma is the orientation of the rest. It takes as an input the array A that I gave into the, uh, that I found earlier, the time T and the freezing time T freeze. It's the same as the ending time. So let's set up P to be equal to zero initially in the setup of the function. And if T is more than T freeze, then I'll freeze the system in place. I do that by setting T is equal to T freeze. And I will iterate again from I is equal to one to three to find the value of the X, Y, and Z um, coordinates of the gripper at each time step. A0 plus A1T plus A2T squared plus A3 T cubed. PI1 is going to be the X component, P2 is the Y component, and P3 is the Z component. And for gamma, I'm doing it outside this loop in here. So this is gamma. And this is going to be the fourth entrance in here. Now I know the location of the gripper at each uh, time step based on the desired trajectory. I'll attach a few things in here. And I need to know the time. Luckily for me, in this real time simulation, I can kind of generate the time uh, or find the value of time very easily using the time block. So I'll attach it in here. It's going to be attached to a few points as well during this demo. So there goes the time. And there goes the coefficients matrix. Now I can't feed the robot arm directly the values of P. This is the directions of the end effector. And what I want to do is to get uh, the joint angles. I'll get to that in a second. Uh, before then, let's give a very quick command for the gripper to either stay closed, uh, stay open or closed. So I'll call this the gripper control function. And it takes two inputs, the time and the freeze time. And it outputs a command for the gripper. I'll call it just gripper. F T is more than T freeze. Then keep the gripper open. Oh, if T is more than T freeze, uh, close the gripper. That. So I'll have command equal to one. Else the gripper is going to be open. I end in here. So this takes two inputs, the freeze time and the input time. So let's get those in here. And please excuse the pretty bad wire handling in here. I kind of don't like my students to do so, but you know, sometimes when you're doing things quickly, uh, things kind of cross out. So the best way to deal with this sort of things is just to create a sub blocks or functions in here. So this now goes into the control of the gripper. And for our uh, analyses, notice that I have a bunch of arrays, so I kind of need to uh, convert them 
into a bunch of numbers individually. So I'll do that using the DMOX. It takes one input and gets the four elements out of that input. This gives you the joint angles for the joints that we have in the robot. Which I need to calculate. Before that, I want to introduce you to this block. So this is the heavy math block. This is the inverse dynamics block or in inverse kinematics. It takes the joint angles. Uh, it takes, sorry, the location of the end effector and it produces the joint angles. Students in this demo are supposed to have already completed this inverse kinematics block in a previous lab. All what they need to do is to move sequentially in the process now and use the block that they have derived. So this is student made block for inverse kinematics. It takes the desired location of the end effector as an input. Uh, for my demo, while I can control the orientation of the rest, I'll just keep it a constant for the time being. I'm just going to say that the rest is always going to be at an angle of zero and that's it. Now, inverse kinematics by nature uh, might give you multiple solutions. You can either grip into something from the top or from the bottom, for example. And you kind of want to maintain your orientation for uh, for the robot. You don't want to jump from one solution to, to another. And this is why you're going to see in a bit that I have a function called phi previous. This gives you information about the joint angle uh, from history so that the robot does not jump from one solution to the next. So I will be feeding the previous. Oops, yeah, I'll be feeding the previous uh, joint angles from the previous time steps into the robots inverse kinematics code as a uh, as a part of the function to ensure that the robot does not jump from one solution to the other and the transition is as smooth as possible. So those are stuff that I'm reading directly from the sensor readings for my robotic arm. And now I get the joint angles that I need to feed to, to the robot, and I get it into the robot. Effectively, the code is done in here. The most complicated part is something that I didn't even have to, to deal with. It's communicating with the robotic arm. It's writing and reading, and that part is taken care of by the, the hell write and hell read sort of functions. Last thing I want to do is have a visual uh, cue for me about where is the robot uh, in its execution. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make the LEDs for the robotic arm um, green when the robot is not yet in the gripping mode, when T is less than T freeze. And I will turn the LEDs red when the robot freezes in place to make sure that everything is working fine. Ideally, this is what I'm going to see. But if I don't, then I have a good idea about what to troubleshoot for. So let's connect the time in here as our input for the switch. And again, sorry for the poor uh, wire management. Get those colors in here. Colors are an array of three elements, RGB. So I'm going to create a DMOX to read the different uh, R, G, and B values and feed them individually as digital inputs into my uh, robotic arm display. So this goes here, this goes here, and this goes here. And if I want to, I can get more readouts from the robot. So for example, if I want to get the currents, and if I want to plot them all in one plot, I can bundle them into a single array using a mux. So let's attach these here. And if I want to, for the sake of argument, also read the velocities, I can do the same. I'll get the outputs here into a scope and call the scope currents. I'll get another scope for the joint angles to track them in real time. 
I'll call that joint angles. And I'm going to create one final mox for the joint velocities, bundle them together, and take them through a scope. And this is all, all that is. So now I have the complete application. I have the uh, desired trajectory, the cubic spline, inverse dynamics. I can communicate with the robot and I can read from it as well. So I'll be cutting this part. So this is the, the fun part of troubleshooting. One of the functions in here that I created had an, a function end. Uh, with en instead of end which caused matlab to complain so five minutes later after we get that thing sorted out let's see in here i deploy the code here into a virtual ver version of the robotic arm now the robot arm led is green is tracking the trajectory it holds into the cube. Now it freezes in place and the LED is red. Um, so this is the end of this video. Let me show you very quickly. So this is the file I was talking about earlier. The robot arm as well. I changed the freeze time to two in this case. And hopefully my computer is a little uh, weak juggling a bunch of things together. So hopefully you can run this. Um, so let me run this very quick. Let's run it a bit better if it decides. I think that recording is really taking all of the resources out of my computer. Uh, let's just give it a moment, see if it's going to be able to. In the meantime, in the virtual uh, environment that I have in here, you might notice that I'm uh, seeing the radial coordinates in here, and I can also have the um, Cartesian coordinates. I can we just take out the rectilinear coordinates in here, uh, and let's let's keep the polar coordinates. I can view the RGB cameras as well. The robot arm is equipped with. Uh, a depth camera. And so one of the later experiments in the course is for the robot arm to generate the trajectory by itself through machine vision. And so every step of the way, one part of the, the project builds upon each other. And so this offers a pretty nice and synergistic sort of sequential project design for um, robotic arms. Um, and again, like the full task for the robotic arm is to go from here, pick this block and go all the way back and place it in its spot and go back and forth. It should be there any second. Uh, the students need to do the full thing. It's very iterative from a deploy standpoint though. There we go. And we freeze in here. Repeat the process again with different uh, starting point and ending point for the trajectory planning, and you get the robot's arm to move in there. Um, story of this took a while. This computer is struggling a little bit, juggling between uh, simulating a model and between recording 
uh, and uh, sharing screen. So let's stop in here. Let me get this thing stopped. Okay. Correct orientation, go back to hardware, and there we are. So this is what I wanted to, to show off. The robotic arm is pretty straightforward to control. In our courses, we focus on using MATLAB for teaching students programming. And so it, it's very intuitive for students, from my experience, to jump from what they've studied in MATLAB for simulations and courses like automatic control, vibrations, dynamics, and go into controlling a robotic arm with very, very minimal sort of overhead for learning in the programming language. Well, with this, uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, listening to uh, my demonstration and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan for the amazing presentation. Mm -hmm. I think we can proceed to answer the questions that may have come in from the audience at this point. Uh, so we got a question here. What do you think are the advantages of using MATLAB and Kwanzaa for teaching robotics? I think the biggest advantage that I'm seeing is that uh, it helps really aligning everything uh, together in, in the curriculum. Um, it is very tricky um, going through multiple programming languages within a single curriculum, especially in, in my area of mechanical engineering, where the curriculum is, is very big as is, and it's very hard to find the time to learn new programming languages just as a part of solving something. MATLAB tends to be pretty convenient for uh, courses like automatic control, for example, and it's pretty convenient for solving differential equations and so forth. And so we use it commonly in mechanical engineering. The problem usually comes from the jump from learning MATLAB to having to deal with a robotic arm and have to spend a few weeks just teaching students a new programming language just so that you can you know, have students run, run an experiment when the goal is to apply robotics and apply the concepts you have rather than, uh, you know, rather than having to learn a programming language and a lot of things to, to do to do the task that you want to do. So I hope this this answered your question. Um, we got another message from Oliver. Uh, what do you expect your students are able to do after completing this course and the lab? Um, so. In general, this robotics course is an interdisciplinary course by nature. Um, I kind of focus on the mechanical part of the uh, uh, the robotic systems, forward kinematics, inverse kinematics, and controls. Now, additionally, I expect students to be able to implement a little bit of programming ability. So later in the course, um, trajectory generation is done after some sort of vision. So either uh, basic image processing with like edge detection and so forth, or possibly uh, machine learning as well. It's pretty convenient that the, the Kwanzaa robot arm has um, a depth-based camera, so it, it really helps you being able to find the location of the object that you want to find. And so a step beyond this, a few labs after this, the goal is do not tell the robot arm where to go. The robot arm will have to figure out where the object to pick up is and do it. And of course, you can expand that beyond this. For robotic arms, the goal is to get the end effector to some location and follow a trajectory. That can be to pick and place. It can be to weld. It can be to write. It can be to you know operate a screwdriver. It can be for anything, really. So the goal is for students to be comfortable with the dynamics of a robot, the control of the robot, and you know, sending commands for the robotic arm. Thank you for your question.
Okay, perfect. Uh, if you have any other questions for Dr. Hassan, please uh, feel free to add them to the chat. You can also send them to us um, at a later point and we'll run them by him and have them available for you. If you have any questions after this webinar, you can visit Quasar.com or email info at Quasar.com as well. We'll be happy to chat with you. Last but not the least, thank you again for joining us today. Have a great day or night ahead. Thank you.